Seeing as this video got popular and there's a demand to do more of these, I will now deliver you more. Here is episode 2 of America's Forgotten Iron Horses. Let's get straight into it, shall we? Let's start off with the Milwaukee Road's F6 Hudson's, also known as Baltics. Talk about the Midwestern's equivalent to the famous Dreyfus Hudson's. 14 F6s were built by Baldwin in 1930, with an additional 8 members in 1931, classified as F6A. These Hudson's would tackle trains between Chicago and Minneapolis. Their performance was quite good for their type, as they could easily manage a 9-10 car train while going at 92 miles an hour over the span of 65 miles. One test shown that one Hudson complete 10 trips between Minneapolis and Harleton, Montana within 30 days, and without the engine going out of service for servicing. The most notable member of the class was number 6402, which was doing a test run between Chicago to Milwaukee and topping up at 103 miles an hour, which was likely the first time a steam locomotive officially topped 100 miles an hour in the United States. Because of these tests, the F6 Hudsons would eventually lead to the creation of the F7 Hudsons, which were built to tackle the Hiawasa services and were equally as successful. Nonetheless, the Baltic soldier on until retirements began in 1952, with the last ones being retired by December 1954, a somber end for these iconic backbones of the Midwest. Now we're jumping to the cargo moving railroad with the Norfolk and Western K class. These were heavily underrated, seeing as they were the last Norfolk and Western design that wasn't articulated or built to superpower standards. These versatile-looking mountains were built by Alco, Baldwin, and the Norfolk and Western themselves between 1916 to 1926, across the K1, K2, K2A, and K3 classes. These locomotives were built to handle mixed traffic on the Norfolk and Western, but despite these engines getting their work done, they did suffer from a few flaws. Seeing as the designs of the mountains were based on the CNOs, they had rather small drivers and rather long rods. This resulted in what's known as dynamic augment, where the rods would pull each driving axle off the rail and slam back during each wheel rotation. Because of these flaws, the mountains were restricted down to lower speeds of 35 miles an hour, and were eventually downgraded onto lighter duty seeing as more powerful locomotives arrived. If you were sold off to the Richmond, Fredericksburg, and Potomac in 1944, and the Rio Grande in 1945, but some members of the fleet would continue lumbering on past the war. In 1945, the K2s would receive an overhaul that gave them roller bearings, better stokers and cylinders, and streamlining that was the same one as the iconic J-Class Northerns. Despite the upgrades, the K2s, alongside the remaining K-Classes, were retired between 1957 and 1959, with no member surviving the preservation. Seeing as everyone idolizes the big three superpower chads, the K-Classes were also important on helping the Norfolk and Western of heavier trains during their time of need. Returning to the Midwestern Hudsons, we have the Chicago, Burlington, and Quincy's S4 Hudsons. Another prime example of an efficient Hudson, huh? Twelve of them were built in 1930 by Baldwin, with two members being built in the CB&Q's own shops. These Hudsons were assigned to haul the Burlington's top link trains like the Aristocrat and the Black Hawk, and they gained a good reputation with the crews for their reliability. However, a few years later, newer stainless steel Zephyr train sets and diesel locomotives were coming in which essentially displaced steam from regular top point trains. However, two Hudsons were rebuilt with streamlined shrouding in case one of the diesels would break down. Number 4000 and the additional S4A, number 4001, were rebuilt with a new valve gear frame, box pot drivers, roller bearings, and lightweight side rods. The first member to receive the treatment was 4000, who was nicknamed Alias, also nicknamed Big Alice the Goon, with 4001 getting the same treatment after that. Three more would get the same running gear upgrades, but not the shrouding. The Hudsons would continue serving on regular passenger trains until retirement in 1955. Surprisingly, five of these Hudsons were lucky enough to survive the preservation, which include 3001, 3003, 3006, 3007, and even Alias herself is preserved. While they haven't seen any movement in decades, they keep the history of their class alive as one of the many backbones of the CBQ. Staying with the Midwest, we got the KCS J-Class Texas Types. Well, the Texas Types are usually underappreciated given that many of these were quite massive machines. The Texas and Pacific, the CNO, the Penzi, and the Santa Fe were dominant users of this type. But the KCS ones also should get some recognition. Ten of these were built by Lima in 1937. But what's interesting is that half of them were built to burn coal, and the other half to burn oil to, quote, satisfy both coal and oil industries along the line. 
These giant machines were quite impressive for their type. At 16 feet tall, the large lead and trailing wheels, the 70 inch drivers, and the unique dome casing made them elegant yet powerful and hefty machines. The tractive effort of 93,300 pounds was good enough to handle heavy freight, but it wasn't enough to outbeat the road's 2880 Mallets. Despite being outbeat by them, they really proved their worst during World War II when they were able to keep up the passenger train schedules and handle troop train speeds. The 2104s unfortunately be retired between 1952 and 53 and later scrapped the next year. Despite being slightly underpowered than the Malays, they were another example of what superpowered locomotives were capable of, and they definitely proved their worst on the KCS during their tenure. Bit of a small fun fact, but uh, J-Class number 905 actually had a war bonds advertisement on its tender during uh, World War II. Lionel also made a model of this, so... The class is getting some recognition at least. We're returning back to the Milwaukee Road with their other Hiawassas. Now I know some of you are either thinking that there is no other Hiawassa if you already have the A-Class Atlantics and the F-7 Hudsons. Well, I'm not referring to those, as instead I'm referring to these. First starting off with the Pacifics. They were originally built in 1910 as F-3 Pacifics and mainly tackled passenger traffic on the Milwaukee Road. In 1940, they would get rebuilt in F-1 Pacifics with a wider firebox and streamlined casing similar to their Hudson counterparts, as they were put to use on the Chippewa Hiawassa that ran between Chicago to Onondaga, Michigan. I feel like I butchered that. Two 10-wheelers would get a similar treatment in the form of numbers 2765 and 2769. Both G6PSs built in 1925 and 1926 by Baldwin, they would be rebuilt with streamlining between 1936 and 1937, for use on the Northwoods Hiawatha. Their streamlining had matched the Atlantics, albeit compressed and admittedly, they looked adorable for 10 wheelers, like they were, and I quote, dipped in the locomotive fountain of youth. However, like their bigger counterparts, once the diesels took over the Hiawassas, both the Pacifics and 10 wheelers were downgraded to lighter work, with the 10 wheelers getting deshrouded and returning to the regular guys as regular locomotives. The 10 wheelers would go in 1951 and the Pacifics by 1954. While none of the Pacific survive, one 10-wheeler, however, does still exist in the former Milwaukee Road 1004, which is tucked away in a shed in Austin, Minnesota on display. These locomotives were the hidden gems of that iconic Hiawassa, as they proved that older locomotives can get retrofit to look modern for their type. Kinda like parents trying to look hip in front of their kids. Time to dive into the West Coast for the first time with the Union Pacific's MTs. Another case of a mountain taking over lighter locomotives. In this case, the Rhodes Mikados were not capable of handling freight trains at high speed over the 484 mile run between Ogden, Utah and Cheyenne, Wyoming. The reason? Well... The drivers being small to meet new scheduled timetables. Alka would give a solution to UP's dilemma with 65 482s built in 1922. With young valve gear, 73 inch drivers, attractive effort of 54,838 pounds, and weighing 348,000 pounds. They seemed like an ideal locomotive for the handle of jobs, right? Well, they did pose problems though, such as them being rather a little overweight to comply with the weight restriction on the route they were assigned to, and the controversial choice of using young valve gear. But these problems were eventually ironed out through rebuilds, and they soon found work handling trains across the Union Pacific's network, as they could tackle anything from passenger trains to heavy freight trains. Some members of the class would get a few small recognitions, however. 7002 was rebuilt with Timken's roller bearings and streamlining from the Rhodes 49er as a substitute for the diesels. Another member to get some significance was number 7016, as it was chosen to pull the Union Pacific's portion of the U.S. President's Warren G. Harding funeral train, which happened on August 5, 1923. Outside of the funeral train and streamlining, the mountains would be superseded by challengers and big boys on heavy freight, but they continued on other duties until retirements began in 1949, but the last one's gone by 1956. A bit of an interesting fact, though, is that the class is well documented by one photographer. Otto C. Perry, who is an underrated photographer for rail family, has captured a giant portion of the MTs in service throughout the Steam era, with his collection easily being available on the Denver Public Library's website. I'd recommend you go check out his collection. I do think it's a worthwhile experience. Now we have the last two locomotives in one segment, those being the Delaware and Hudson's P1s and K26s. 
I will say the DNH's roster was definitely weird. From secondhand diesels to very questionable steam head. locomotives. <laughs> Even their conventional steam locomotives look weird compared to other railroads. Maybe it's because of the clean aesthetic the locomotives had, I don't know. But I will say compared to other classes the DNH had, these two locomotives take the cake for the DNH's locomotive practices. The three P1s were constructed in the DNH's own shops in 1929 as a trio of experimental locomotives. It's evident with two locomotives being fitted with poppet valves and the other piston valves, and their rather British inspired design is evident with their flange stack, headlight mounts in the center, and the lack of external piping on the boiler. If anything, it looks more like a Japanese locomotive, like the JNR C53 class. Seeing as the DNH wasn't big on passenger service, the DNH didn't develop the P1 further. Although, this wouldn't be the last of new passenger locomotives. It was until 1943 when Alco outshipped 15484s to DNH, classifying them as K26s. They primarily handled both freight trains and passenger trains between New York to Montreal. Compared them to other northerns, they were rather small for their type, but they made good use for a 7 feet long combustion chamber in their firebox. The boiler design also has to be taken for granted, as it would have a regular ratio of boiler to, which was later carried out on the other northern designs, such as the Milwaukee Rose S3s or the Union Pacific's FEFs. However, the K26s were too little too late for the steam party, as diesels began taking over pasture operations on the DNH, and by 1953, all Pacifics and Northerns were off the roster and reduced it down to nothing but memories. However, the class did get a brief revival. During 1973, to celebrate the 150th anniversary of the DNH, Canadian Pacific's number 1278 and Reading T1 number 2102 were selected to masquerade as long lost DNH locomotives, those being numbers 653 and 302 respectively, and they spent the year hauling excursions masquerading as these DNH locomotives. And for a time, the class got some recognition by regular rail fans. Both of these masquerade locomotives are still around, as Reading 2102 was recently returned to steam, and 1278's tucked away in the Age of Steam roundhouse following a, uh, <laughs> incident. It's safe to say that these locomotives brought back the legacy of these lost CNH classes. Despite both classes seeing little relevancy, they were the backbone of the DNH's very few passenger services, and they left the mark on not only the DNH, but other railroads as well, seeing as the K26's design has been carried out on the other Northerns, including the Living Legend and the 261, which are still around today. It's these reasons why these two classes will always be remembered as America's forgotten workhorses. If there's one thing I will say about these DNH locomotives, the Pacifics with smoke deflectors saves them from being ugly machines, so I'm kind of glad that they did stuck on it. Okay, never mind, I want to die. <laughs>